Um, so I just was sharing something from Song of Solomon. And if you're not aware, Song of Solomon is uh, a conversation pretty much between Jesus and the church. It's symbolic in nature, and we've talked about that before. Uh, we've talked a lot about Song of Solomon before, and it's uh, the bride in Song of Solomon is the church, and Solomon represents Jesus. And so there's a lot to go in with that. But uh, it's important to know that because then you can kind of understand who the characters are, are symbolic of. And in Song of Solomon 8, 6, I just want to read the two verses here. Um, it says, uh, Set me as a seal upon your heart and as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death and jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Now this is Solomon talking to um, the bride. So this would be Jesus speaking to us. And just notice what he says here. He says, for love is as strong as death, and jealousy is as cruel as the grave. And this is a perfect picture. This is a perfect prophecy, really, of what Jesus was coming to do for us. Because the Bible says very clearly, we were actually just singing about it a second ago, that God demonstrates his love toward us, right? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it is the death of Jesus. God is pointing to the death of Jesus and the price that he paid to show, this is how much I love you, right? So this is a perfect prophecy here of that fact, that it says that Solomon's love, or this is obviously talking about Jesus in reality, um, that Solomon here is just a character symbol of Jesus. So he's, this is saying here, Jesus is saying to us that my love for you is as strong as death. And again, that's measurable because Jesus actually died to get us back. So that is a, that's something you can actually see in Scripture and measure the love of God and know the length, the height, the depth, the width of the love of God by looking at what Jesus paid for you to provide what he did for you. So he said that love is as strong as death and jealousy is cruel as the grave. And again, I'll just mention this, that jealousy here is talking about like a godly kind of jealousy, right? You shouldn't covet something that's not yours or someone else's wife or something that doesn't belong to you. But uh, jealousy in this case is a godly jealousy because it was right for God to desire us, right? Because we didn't belong where we were. You know, the devil was kind of holding us captive and we didn't belong there. And so God's desire to get us back was a, a good kind of jealousy, right? Um, and so this is jealousy, though. So the jealousy of Jesus is, is as cruel as the grave. So you know that's also measurable because he went to the grave. And the grave here, again, is probably talking about not so much like a dirt grave, but the grave meaning the name for hell, which Jesus did go to. Uh, you know, it, the Bible talks about how he went to hell and preached to those who were, you know, in prison there. And there's more to go in with that. But Jesus, after he, for the three days that he was dead, what, did go to hell. So he's saying, when he says that his jealousy is as cruel as the grave, he's saying, my desire is so strong it, that it, it, is, it is stronger than the grave. And, and you can see that because Jesus' desire to get you back was so strong that it drove him to go to die and to go to the grave if it meant getting you back. So when, again, jealousy as cruel as the grave means that's how strong his desire to get you back was, right? Because that's what jealousy is speaking about here. Uh, and then verse 7, this is really cool. Uh, verse 7 says, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. That's a, this is a really important thing because many waters, most people don't, see that. But many waters here, when it says that many waters cannot quench love and the floods cannot drown it, he's talking about his love for us, right? And when he says many waters, he's actually talking about hell there. He's actually talking about like the underworld, under the earth. That's what he's talking about. And when he talks about many waters and the floods, you know that because in Jonah 2-3, um, it, it, it actually, actually, it's Jonah 2 verse 2 actually, uh, Jonah prophesies as if he were Jesus, having died and gone to hell. And he prophesies and says, I cried uh, by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Notice this. He says, out of the belly of hell cried I. You know he's prophesying because Jonah wasn't in hell at the time. He was in the belly of the fish. And so it says, out of the belly of hell cried I. So what's he talking about? The belly of what? The belly of hell. He's prophesying as Christ. Talking about, he just said there, hell. Keep that in mind. He says, and, he, and you heard my voice. Verse 3, it says, For you have cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. So you see he's calling hell the deep, he's calling hell the seas. And it says, And the floods compassed me about. Thy billows and your waves passed, passed over me. He's describing hell. The word sea, if you're not familiar with that, is a symbolic word for hell. That's what it is. Uh, that's why even in, in, in the book of Revelation, it says, And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. That's what that's referring to. It is referring to, and, and you know, I'm using the word hell because we're familiar with that, but it's talking about some place in the underworld. All right, there's more specifics there. 
But actually, in verse, if you look at verse 5, for instance, he keeps talking and says, the waters compass me about, even to the soul. The depth closed, round, uh, closed me round about. So if you just jump back now to Song of Solomon 8-7, you know when he says, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. He's not just being metaphorical, because I think we just read this stuff and we don't think like God has any particular intention in saying it. He's just being metaphorical and he's just being flowery with his speech. No, this, God, God means what he's saying here. And when he says that many waters could not quench his love, he's saying hell could not stop my love for you. He's saying the floods or hell could not drown it. So he's, he, that, that's what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? I knew that I was going to have to die and I was going to have to go to hell for three days in order to get you back. And he's saying that could not stop my love. That could not quench my love. That, that is not enough. That is not enough of an obstacle to put between me and you to somehow stop me or stop my love and stop my jealousy and stop my desire to want you back. Uh, that, that's not enough. That's what he's saying here by saying many waters cannot quench love. And then he goes on to say again, He's saying, hell couldn't stop my love for you, and if a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned. Um, again, I shared this before service, but uh, this is like the parallel verse to uh, in the book of Hebrews. I think it's Hebrews chapter 12, but uh, when Jesus says that, or it's said of Jesus, that for the glory that was set before him, it says he endured the cross despising the shame. And that word despising the shame is talking about he thought it was a small thing. He, he thought it was a small thing. All the shame that he endured at the cross, all the pain that he endured at the cross, all the sacrifice that he made at the cross for you, he thought it was a small thing. And he, this is like that parallel verse. It's saying that if a man were to give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned. In other words, it would be despised. It would be considered a small thing. And this, again, I'll just kind of stop here, but this is this is describing still the love of Jesus. He's saying it's as strong as death. Hell can't stop this. Hell can't quench my love. And on top of all that, he said, listen, if I were to give up all the substance, all the possessions of my house, all of my wealth and everything that I own, which Jesus in fact did, he gave up every single bit of everything that he owned and every pleasure that he ever enjoyed for all eternity with the Father. He said, if I were to give up all of that, it would be utterly contemned. In other words, it would be utterly despised. And literally what this is saying is that the huge sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the pain that he endured and the forsaking from the Father and having given everything up, there wasn't a single thing that he kept. He gave everything up completely forsaken by the, by the Spirit. And when he gave up everything for us and all the pain that he endured and all the shame he endured, it says that he considered that sacrifice a small thing in comparison to his desire to get you back. In other words, I would have done much more if it meant getting you back. Uh, the sacrifice that Jesus, as, as big a deal as that is, and as much as that provided to us, Jesus saying here that he thought that sacrifice was, was, was not a big deal to get you back. And I think, again, as I said pre-service as well, um, man, that, that just, when you know how much God loved you, and when you know that what Jesus died to provide everything to you, and when you know his jealousy toward you and his desire to, and the fact that God wants you, it's not just like he threw, he threw a, a life preserver out and he's going to save your life. You know anyone would do that. No, it's when you, at the point that you didn't care about God, and at the point where you rejected him, he didn't reject you. And at the point that you, you were, we were yet sinners, um, the Lord, his desire, the fact that he wanted you, and the price that he was willing to pay because of how much he wanted you, and that even hell could not stop his desire for you. As I said pre-service, that this is a, you know, you, you simply cannot have a bad day when you know things like that. And people's rejection or acceptance of you becomes a non-issue. It's a, you, you stop looking for the acceptance of people. You stop relying on the acceptance of people. You, you stop, you know, trying to seek that out because you feel a need for acceptance when you know that you've been accepted in the beloved, and when you know how much that God wanted you uh, and what he was willing to pay to get you, again, that puts such an intrinsic value on you, not because of anything you've done for God, but simply because of his love for you and how much he wanted you. Uh, again, when you know that, there's, you, you can't be walking around being down and stuff. You, you, you simply can't um, care anymore about the little things that happen in this life. You know how much God loved you. You know what that means to you and all that he gave up for you to get all that to you, um, it's something that will just uh, 
It, it changes your mentality. Something as simple as that, just knowing how much God loved you, um, again, it'll change your mentality about things, and you, you stop seeing things as such a big deal anymore. It really is not a big deal. Jesus did everything for us. He provided everything to us, and everything that he had to give up to provide all that to you, he said, I, I feel that that's a small sacrifice to make to get you. That's a pretty cool thing. So, uh, again, everybody should be having a good day when you realize that kind of stuff, right? If we were able to show you something about Jesus today, subscribe and share this with someone else so that we can get this awesome truth out to the world.